Hello and welcome to our webcast. Today's topic will be chilled beams. My name is Randy Zimmerman and I'll be presenting today's program. Later I'll be joined by Matt McLaren, Joe Hirsch, and Giannis Rosenbergs for the question and answer portion of today's program. Matt is a product engineer at Titus with chilled beam experience. Joe is our design and development manager and Giannis is our product manager for chilled beams and a number of other product lines. In today's webcast, we'll explain what chilled beams are and how to apply them. We'll look at the two types of chilled beams and the construction features found in these products. We'll also look at water-based heating and cooling and how it can be used to reduce energy and operating costs. Although it might make sense to refer to these products as thermal beams, our industry is standardized on chilled beams. Although this name implies that these products are only suitable for cooling applications, that's not true. Chilled beams can heat, cool, or provide both heating and cooling. There are two types of chilled beam products. There are passive beams and there are active beams. Passive beams are only supplied with water and active beams are supplied with both water and air. The applications for passive beams are somewhat limited. They're only supplied with water so they don't address ventilation requirements of an occupied space. This means that a separate ventilation system and outlets must be required. Since passive beams are typically ceiling mounted, they are most frequently used to provide only supplemental cooling to a space. Most of the recent interest in chilled beams comes from the wider possibilities that active beams present to the designer. Since both water and air are supplied to the active beam, it can address both the thermal and ventilation needs of an occupied space. We already know how to condition spaces with central air handlers and overhead diffusers, so what makes a chilled beam so interesting? Well, it mainly comes down to water. Although a conventional system uses air to transport heating and or cooling to a space, a chilled beam system handles the heating and or cooling requirements with water instead. Water is a far more efficient way to transport thermal energy. Since the volumetric heat capacity of water is about 3,500 times greater than air, we can use a water line to replace a much larger duct. In fact, a one inch water pipe can handle the heating and cooling capacity of an 18 by 18 inch air duct. It also takes far less energy to move water through a pipe than it does to move air through a duct. Since the distance is the same, the potential savings are huge. A water pump can move the same amount of thermal energy as a fan, but at one seventh the operating cost. But what about ventilation? Obviously, a conventional system with overhead diffusers can be designed to meet the ventilation needs of the space, but it can't do it in the most efficient way. In order to meet the heating and especially the cooling requirements, the air volume supplied must be high enough to handle the loads. This volume is often much higher than is actually required to meet the ventilation requirements, so it results in wasted energy when only ventilation is needed. Before we go any further, we need to explain some terminology associated with psychrometrics. Psychrometrics literally means pertaining to the measurement of cold, but it's a science that uses the principles of thermodynamics to analyze the condition and properties of moist air. A basic understanding of psychrometrics is necessary in order to understand the mechanics of heating and cooling processes. We don't need to know a lot about psychrometrics for the purposes of this presentation, but it's important we understand the difference between sensible and latent processes. Sensible heating or cooling is any process that changes the dry bulb temperature of room air without any change in the moisture content. In layman's terms, this is the change in room temperature that doesn't change the humidity level. Latent heating is defined as increasing the heat content of air by increasing the moisture content without changing the dry bulb temperature. Since latent heat exists in the form of moisture in air, it's important to know that it takes about 970 BTUs per pound to vaporize water at sea level. This is known as the latent heat of vaporization. Chilled beams should only be used for sensible heating and cooling. They can raise or lower the, the air temperature of a room, but they cannot remove moisture from room air. Humidity reduction is a latent process that involves condensation. Since a chilled beam is located in a room, 
usually at or just below the ceiling, it is unsuitable for condensate piping. So how do chilled beam systems address latent loads? It's handled by the supply air. Cool, dry air is supplied by the air handler or dedicated outdoor air system, and condensate is removed at the cooling coil. This means that the air volume is often much less than that of a conventional system with overhead diffusers because it only has to meet the ventilation and latent heat removal requirements. This results in smaller ductwork and possibly lower system static pressures. Now let's look at temperatures. In a typical office situation, the desired room temperature is 72 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. In a conventional system with an air handler and overhead diffusers, the supply air for cooling is 50 to 55 degrees and the supply air for heating is 90 to 95 degrees. If the supply air must be reheated by a terminal unit by means of, of a hydronic coil, it would typically be supplied with 180 degree water. In a chilled beam system, the same office would be supplied with 63 to 68 degree air. This air could be generated by mixing 50 to 55 degree air and return air at a conventional air handler, or the air could be supplied by a dedicated outdoor air system. Sensible cooling would be handled by 55 to 63 uh, degree water, and sensible heating would require water at a temperature not to exceed 140 degrees. In order to keep our cooling process sensible, it's critical that we prevent condensation from occurring on the beams. If we follow ASHRAE guidelines for good indoor air quality, we should keep the relative humidity of the room air below 60 percent. Most buildings operate at 50 to 55 percent relative humidity. At 72 to 74 degree room temperature, this corresponds to a dew point temperature of 52 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to prevent condensation, it's generally recommended that water temperatures uh, should be 3 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit above the dew point. This means that the minimum water temperature should be 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So how do chilled beams work? Let's start out by looking at a passive beam. As we said before, passive beams are supplied with water only to provide sensible cooling. These beams are linear in design and are usually suspended just below the ceiling or roof surface. Ideally, the beam should be located at least 8 inches below the ceiling. The top and bottom of the beam must be open to allow air to move through it. The bottom is often fitted with a louvered or perforated cover to block the view of the coil. There will also be a coil with a two-pipe connection. As water, typically 55 to 63 degrees Fahrenheit, is circulated through the internal circuits of the beam, warmer air from the room rises and falls through the beam. This entire process is an example of convection. Hot air rises and cold air falls. The water temperatures and room humidity level must be carefully monitored and controlled so as to prevent any condensation from forming on the surface of the beam. Now let's look at the common construction features found on active beams. There's a primary air inlet that could be tapped in from the top, side, or end of the unit. There's a primary air plenum that will be pressurized. A pressure tap is often provided to allow the balancer to determine the primary air volume based on the static pressure of the plenum. The plenum will also be fitted with a series of discharge nozzles. The bottom center section is typically fitted with a louvered or perforated return air grill that will allow air movement while blocking the view of the coil. There will also be a coil designed for either a two-pipe or a four-pipe water connection. There will also be one or more discharge slots running the length of the unit on one or both sides. Active beams take advantage of the same convective forces as passive beams, but with a few big differences. Since active beams are supplied with air as well as water, they can provide much higher capacity through increased air motion. Active beams can also handle heating as well as cooling. Even more importantly, active beams address ventilation and latent loads. Before we continue, we need to understand the difference between the terms entrainment and induction. These two terms are often used interchangeably in our industry, but they don't have the same meaning, and induction is very important to the operation of an active beam. When air discharges from an outlet, room air moves towards the outlet, resulting in low-velocity room air motion. This is called entrainment. 
some portion of the air involved in the low velocity room air motion actually reaches the outlet and mixes with the discharge jet. This is what we refer to as induction. Cool and dry air, typically 63 to 68 degrees, is supplied to the internal plenum of an active beam. This primary air discharges through a series of nozzles creating entrainment. As the room air is entrained by the discharge jet of the active beam, this induced air is drawn up and through the beam where it mixes with the primary air and is then discharged into the room. The nozzles are absolutely critical to the performance of an active chilled beam. The nozzles must be properly selected to handle the primary air volume and create the induction required to achieve the cooling capacity. Although active beams are usually only available in a few standard lengths, differences in the size, number, and style of nozzle can create major differences in all aspects of beam performance. When describing the air distribution characteristics of an active beam, it could be said to perform like a linear diffuser. Just like linear diffusers, active beams are commonly available in one-way and two-way models, either allowing air to move in one direction or two directions. The throw performance also resembles a slot diffuser with relatively long throws and high induction. There's that word induction again. The amount of induction created by nozzles is critical to the performance of an active beam. According to ASHRAE, the induction ratio of any air outlet is equal to the total supply air volume divided by the primary air volume. So if an active beam was supplied with 500 CFM of primary air, but the total supply air in the discharge jet was 1,000 CFM, it would have an induction ratio of 2. The good news is that many active beams available today have induction ratios of 3, and this is likely to rise through further innovations in nozzle or outlet design. Water-based systems, as opposed to conventional all-air systems, allow the designer to decouple the loads. Since room temperature will be controlled by water flow through a chilled beam, all sensible heating and cooling will be handled by the water side of the system. This is accomplished by modulating water valves by a room temperature sensor. Latent loads and ventilation requirements will be handled by the air side of the system that typically provides a constant volume of cool, dry air to the space. Now that we know what passive and active beams are, let's take a look at the best practices and applications for both. Passive beams are best suited for handling spaces where the sensible loads range from 15 to 25 BTUs per hour per square foot. They're typically used to provide additional cooling to offset loads created by internal heat sources like office machines. For this reason, they are often found in low occupancy spaces like server rooms. Supply water temperature should be maintained 3 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit above the room dew point to prevent the possibility of condensation. In addition, the control system must be designed to automatically shut down water flow to the beams in the event that windows or outside doors are left open, allowing excessive outdoor air infiltration. Currently, the passive beams are tested and performance rated in accordance with a European standard called EN14518. Now let's take a look at the controls required to operate chilled beams. Each zone will require a thermostat or room controller with a room temperature sensor. It will be powered by 24 volts AC. This controller will have output capability to operate water valves to control cooling and or heating in the case of an active beam. The valves could either be two position on-off valves or zero to 10 volt DC modulating valves. While on-off valves should be adequate for the purpose of controlling chilled beams, it is best if they open and close slowly. Now let's take a look at active beam applications. It's much easier to find good applications for active beams because they handle both sensible and latent while addressing ventilation requirements. Generally speaking, they're best suited for spaces where sensible loads range from 19 to 25 BTUs per hour per square foot, but they've been successfully applied to handle up to 40 BTUs per hour per square foot. As far as air volume requirements, they're best suited to spaces requiring from 0.3 to 0.6 CFM per square foot. When applying active beams, the sensible heat ratio, or SHR, must be taken into account. This is defined as the sensible heat load divided by the total heat load. Of course, the total heat load is the sum of the sensible and the latent loads. In order to 
be suitable for active beams, the sensible heat ratio should be 0.7 or greater. In situations where latent loads are high, the sensible heat ratio will be lower and higher ventilation rates would likely make active beams a poor system choice. Whether it's a passive or an active beam, the same care must be taken to ensure that the control system is able to closely monitor supply water temperatures and indoor environmental conditions to prevent the accidental formation of condensation. You should also be aware that new industry standards are being developed for chilled beams. Active beams are currently tested and rated in accordance with a European standard EN15116. ASHRAE is currently developing standard 200 as a method of test for active beams and AHRI is developing standard 1240 for the performance rating and certification of beams. These standards will probably be adopted within the next calendar year. When active beams are being used for cooling only, they should be placed perpendicular to any exterior glass. Unlike passive beams, the best location is directly over any work area or stationary occupants. Since active beams discharge air like conventional ceiling diffusers, this placement provides the highest comfort. When active beams are being used for heating and cooling, they should be placed parallel to any exterior glass. Since they'll be used for heating, it's important that we follow the same rules that would apply to any conventional overhead heating application. Per ASHRAE, we never want discharge temperatures to be more than 15 degrees higher than the desired room temperature. And in order to ensure that we deliver ventilation air to the breathing zone, we want to make sure that our throw to 150 feet per minute is within 4 feet of the floor. In order to achieve good coverage on the glass, we know that lower discharge temperatures always work best. Now let's look at an issue that we need to avoid. One common active beam design mistake involves colliding air streams. When active beams are laid out in a linear fashion, they typically run lengthwise in a room or perpendicular to exterior glass. We need to make sure that adequate space is maintained between these beam rows. While it may be tempting to add an additional row for additional capacity, this can easily result in colliding discharge jets that could result in discomfort to room occupants. In summary, we've explained what passive and active beams are. We've discussed how they can be used to provide sensible cooling and heating. We've looked at the efficiencies of water-based systems in comparison to all air systems and how to prevent accidental condensation. We also looked at the best chilled beam applications and the proper placement of these devices. I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to attend our webcast. I hope that it was informative and educational. Now we'll be happy to take any questions that you may have regarding today's program. Thank you again.